The Sega Genesis, also known as the Sega Mega Drive outside of North America, is a 16-bit video gaming console system released in 1988 in Japan and 89 in North America. The story of the console involves a shocking amount of drama, intrigue, and ruthless marketing, and it would all spark the biggest console war ever seen. It was so much more than just another video game console from the 90s. The Genesis represented the first time Nintendo would have a genuine challenger, and certainly not the last. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and although I am admittedly fairly young, I did to an extent grow up with the Sega Genesis. My mom had one back in the 90s, kept it around, and so in my younger years, I ended up playing a lot of Genesis games. And it's given me a real nostalgia for 16-bit gaming and really retro gaming as a whole. So today we're gonna take a ride down memory lane, or a mega drive, if you will, I'm sorry, and take a very in-depth look at the entire story of the Sega Genesis Genesis and how it stands today. Dave Whitney wanted the real arcade games at home, so he got them. Mike Rogers wanted them too, but he got a Genesis system by Sega. Why? Check it out. Arcade screen left, Genesis screen right. If they look the same, you've answered correctly. Besides, Genesis has real-life action in sports games, flying games, and adventure games. The hottest library going. So if you want real arcade action, there's only two ways to get it. Dave, we got your golden axe. Or get Genesis by Sega. We bring the arcade experience home. The Genesis doing as well as it did was really quite strange when you think about it. It came out of nowhere. The original Nintendo completely dominated markets in the 1980s, and while Sega actually did have a console release in the Master System in 1986, only a year after the NES's release in North America, it completely failed to penetrate the home market and sold terribly poorly in comparison. Sega also actually had two systems before the Master System, and the SG-1000 in 1983 and the SG-1002 in 1984. Both are generally regarded as complete failures, and suffered from Sega's lack of experience in the home gaming market, as well as the Nintendo NES slash Famicom coming out around the same time and featuring much more advanced hardware. Early sales actually outperformed Sega's expectations, but there was no question that the SG-1000 wasn't their future. Early on, keeping this in mind, Nintendo would scoff at the idea of Sega as a competitor, seeing their puny market share as no threat. Instead, they'd be more concerned with the PC Engine, or TurboGrafx-16 in North America, as the hardware was significantly more powerful than the original NES, and it would come out in 1987 in Japan, a year before the Mega Drive would launch in also Japan. The TurboGrafx-16 had one of the most advanced 8-bit CPUs ever made, and yes, 8-bit, but it was modified with two 16-bit graphic processors. The Mega Drive would have a true 16-bit processor, although in real-life use the systems performed similarly. Even so, the TurboGrafx was criticized for marketing itself as a 16-bit machine despite having that 8-bit processor. The console completely failed in North America, but it actually did manage to outsell the Mega Drive in Japan. A year after the Japanese launch in 1989, the Sega Genesis would release in North America with a full true 16-bits, double what the competing Nintendo Entertainment System could output with only 8-bits. Get used to the term of bits because that would be the marketing jargon Sega and Nintendo would use constantly. So what are even bits? 8-bit consoles and 8-bit processors were generally capable of storing and processing data 8 bits at a time. There's no real need to get into the technical specifics, but as you would expect, the 16-bit Genesis was way, way more powerful, allowing for much more detailed graphics, and clearly it was the beginning of a new level in gaming history. But even with the powerful Genesis hardware, it would take a while for games to find their own. Initial games for the Genesis often were near-perfect ports of arcade titles, which was a pretty big selling point, as in the past, arcade ports over to home consoles typically weren't very robust. They often were downgraded versions of the actual arcade game. But still, the Genesis did not have a very good start. It shipped 400,000 units in the first year, and only a week before launch, it was completely overshadowed by Nintendo's release of Super Mario Bros. 3, which is often regarded by many as one of the best 2D side-scrollers of all time. In 1988, the Mega Drive released in Japan, and then the Genesis came to North America in 1989. The European version did not come out until the September of 1990, which is kind of strange. 
it's weird to think about the amount of variation in release timelines worldwide, but this was pretty common in the early days of video game consoles. When Sega was initially looking to move to the North American market, they needed an American partner, as they were a Japanese-based company, and actually approached and offered the rights to Atari. Atari declined acquiring the new console because apparently it was too expensive, and they instead wanted to focus on the Atari ST, a line of home computers, and apparent successors to their old consoles, even though I hadn't heard of them until writing this video. I'm sure Atari were kicking themselves pretty quickly for letting the deal fall through. Sega would get something out of their meetings with Atari though, as the name Genesis was thought up. Sega couldn't maintain the name Mega Drive due to a trademark issue, and America Mega Drive Systems Inc. was a manufacturer of computer storage solutions. They liked the name Genesis, and felt that the Christian connotations of the name would appeal to the widely Christian audience of the US. And so Sega would decide to launch the console through their own Sega of America subsidiary, starting with a limited launch in the August of 1989, and the rest is history. Baseball is my life. Gotta start Oz. Hot hitter. Game time, Tommy. I'm on my way. Get away! Pace is loaded, Tommy. What do we do? But Shift over. Dead oh. full hitter. Double oh. play? What a game! And even my friend Arnie's got a great game. And I get a kick out of soccer and new basketball. Game's over, Tommy. Ain't over till it's over. Genesis by Sega. The Sega Genesis is definitely one of the flashier looking consoles from the early days. It opted for black plastic as opposed to the gray of Nintendo, and prominently features the logo under the cartridge slot, as well as the bold 16-bit lettering to remind you that this was the future. I really like the look of this machine. It's simple and classy while also still somehow being a bit spicier than the plain boxes so common in the 80s and 90s. The controller wasn't anything to write home about, but it did the job and had quite the unique layout. You've got the D-pad on the left, logo in the middle, Middle, start button on the top right, and then three so-called triggers, although buttons would be a bit more accurate in today's context. They're labeled A, B, C, which is quite strange compared to what the standards are today, and does take some getting used to trying to play with it now. There are no bumpers, this is it, plain and simple. And effective, it certainly was better than the Nintendo Entertainment System controller. Those were simple rectangles with a D-pad and two buttons, and that was it. That one could be pretty uncomfortable to hold, but the Super Nintendo controller would build on it, with four buttons, a couple bumpers, and a more ergonomic shape. The Genesis controller hasn't aged the best, but keeping things simple was a big positive in attracting those who had maybe never even owned a console before. It's corded, of course, and we have a couple controller ports at the front of the console. What I have here is the original rendition of the Genesis, and the most common. The Mega Drive in Europe was similar, but even more simple, lacking the logo above the golden 16-bit emblem. It's funny the differences video game makers used to have between different geographical products. From game box art to the look of the console to even the name. I'd say Nintendo was the worst offender with the Famicom compared to the NES. If you brought it over to North America, most probably wouldn't even recognize it as a Nintendo console. I want to quickly mention that there actually was a newer version of the Genesis controller released in 1993, and it would give you six buttons. Among retro gaming enthusiasts, it's thought to be one of the best controllers ever made, and for especially fighting games, it was a huge benefit, making it easier to do combos and giving you more input options. Again, I've got the original Genesis here, or at least one of them. There was the original unit, and then a revised system that looks the same but uses cheaper parts. The sound quality is significantly decreased in the revised version, and so of course, that's the one I have. Easiest way to tell is look for the high definition graphics text on the front of the console. If you don't have it, you've got the revised model. If you do, you have an original. So it's not a concern for me, I have the technically inferior Model 1 Genesis, and uh, that's right, this is only the Genesis Model 1, and for a long time I never realized there were actually more of them. My mom and her brother purchased this back in the 90s, and then my mom took it years later when she married my dad, and so in spite of me being born in the the year 2000, I actually got the 16-bit gaming experience as a child, and attach a lot of nostalgia to retro gaming as a result. And until 94, Sonic 2 and a few others remain prevalent in my early memories. When I think of my childhood console, I tend to reflect on the PS2, but the Genesis is a close second, and that's really something when you think about it, that a kid didn't really see much of a difference between a 90s 16-bit gaming machine and a console capable of playing 3D games that was way beyond anything that existed in the Genesis era. But when it comes down to it, the Genesis was just plain out. 
about fun, and that's all that mattered to me. But back to the subject on hand. This is the Genesis Model 1, and right here, I've got the Genesis Model 2. I picked it up on eBay recently for super cheap, like 40 bucks or something, and while it looks a bit more boring in my opinion, it's also much smaller, compact, and practical. It's still compatible with Genesis add-ons, and beyond the design, there really aren't any benefits over the original, and the audio is still lower quality than the original original, so there's nothing too noteworthy about the Model 2, but it is actually kind of cool when you think of it as like the Genesis Slim. This is quite a bit before Slim versions were typical. I mean, the PS1 would eventually get one, and the PS2, and so on, but Sega already made one in 1993. And then there's the confusing Model 3, or Genesis 3 as it was marketed. After the Genesis was discontinued, Majesco Entertainment, under a license from Sega, released the Genesis 3 as a budget console in 1998. It is missing compatibility with Sega CD and Sega 32X, and it's really dang small. The Sega CD and 32X are add-ons for the Genesis I'll be talking about a little bit later, but I'd like to give a quick shout out to a local game shop for lending them out to me, as they're quite rare and expensive to buy nowadays. So if you find yourself around Abbotsford, British Columbia, Canada, make sure you stop by the House of Cards. They're a great little store and have an awesome selection of retro gaming stuff, as well as trading cards like Magic the Gathering and Pokemon, so huge thanks to them for helping me out. Super cool that I was able to film these and try them out for myself. But back on track here, no official variants of the Genesis Model 3 launched outside of North America as Majesco didn't have the rights in other regions. And the console initially retailed for $50, and then was quickly dropped to 20 bucks. That's right, not much over 20 years ago, you could walk into a local store and buy a tiny version of the Genesis for only $20. Pretty sweet deal. Kind of funny because, while as far as I can tell, this console was never particularly successful, many consoles have picked up a lot of steam in recent history, with the NES and SNES Mini doing really well, and there was a Genesis Mini that launched in 2019, looking exactly like the old Genesis or Mega Drive, depending on your region, and having a limited selection of popular Genesis titles from its heyday. There are obscure variations and licensed versions of the Genesis, including the Genesis Nomad, which was a fully portable Genesis, but I don't want to waste too much time going over absolutely everything. Clearly, Sega melts the Genesis for all it was worth, and given the lack of success in their future hardware, it's hard to blame them. But in all fairness, the Genesis wasn't just a success, it was a major success, kicking off the 16-bit gaming generation with a bang, and at launch, completely blowing away their competition in Nintendo, at least in terms of power. Sega in 1989 may not have had the name recognition Nintendo had, but that wouldn't last for long. Genesis done! 16-bit arcade graphics. You can't do this on Nintendo! Genesis done! 16-bit sports action. You can't Joe Montana free, Pat Riley free, Buster Douglas free, Super Monaco GP free, or Collins free. What Nintendo? I'm not sure there's any more iconic video game advertising campaign than the infamous Genesis does what Nintendo don't. It was a simple, catchy phrase that was brilliant in attracting attention, especially from the edgy, rebellious teen of the 90s that was ready to break through the societal norms in the most conformity-based way possible. Nintendo by 1989 had completely owned the gaming market in North America, and then here comes some random company named Sega directly trash-talking the console everyone and their mothers had heard of. And to be fair, Sega was wasn't wrong. The Genesis was significantly more powerful than the original Nintendo, with double the bits and blast processing. A phrase Sega would coin and didn't really mean much, but sounded very cool. There was no question that the Genesis could produce way, way better graphics, the quality of which had never been seen before in a home system. Consoles were finally getting to the point where they could match and even outdo popular arcade titles, all in the comfort of your own living room, and without draining you of all your quarters. Altered Beast was originally an arcade game made by Sega, and featured 16-bit graphics on an arcade machine that actually had very similar hardware to the Genesis, so of course it made sense to port it over. And it was a great example of immediately how much more detailed graphics could get, with simple things like shading your character that simply wasn't possible to the same extent with 8-bit graphics. Researching this game specifically, it's actually quite fascinating, because while I can find many articles citing it as a classic, and it's been repackaged many times in numerous Genesis collections years later, it also had extremely mediocre reviews 
use at launch, and even in more modern times would still not be considered too great. IGN would describe the Xbox Live Arcade re-release as a relic of the arcade heyday that just doesn't hold up today, but this game on a home system, regardless of what you thought of the title itself, was something that showed the immediate potential of the Genesis. Another great example of what the Genesis could do was with the game Strider, a 1989 arcade title that was ported over to the Genesis near the end of 1990. It featured vibrant colors and fantastic character animations. Even compared to games coming out for years onwards, it would more than hold its own. Strider also came to the Nintendo Entertainment System, and here's what that looked like. Admittedly, it was an entirely different game with a different plot, but it was still based on the same arcade game, and it shows the ridiculous contrast in what these systems were capable of. Strider is also remembered by some as one of the greatest video games of all time, and if you wanted to play it without raiding your mom's coin purse, the Genesis was the only way to do it. Genesis do what Nintendo don't. Well, at least in the beginning. Despite the power and capabilities of the 16-bit Genesis, there weren't a ton of launch titles, and in the first year, Sega really struggled to overcome just how immensely omnipresent Nintendo was in the homes and minds of consumers. Sega of America only sold 500,000 in the first year. Not a small number for a console that was coming out of nowhere, but Japan had tasked them to sell 1 million units. CEO of American Sega, Michael Katz, the man who pushed for the aggressive marketing campaign, was replaced by a man named Tom Kalinske only a year after Michael had been recruited. Kalinske immediately developed a four-point plan that would boost the Genesis to greater relevancy. The price of the console was cut, an American team meant to develop games specifically for American audiences was created, the already aggressive advertising campaigns were expanded, and the game that was bundled with the system, Altered Beast, was replaced with some random new game that had just come out. The Japanese board of directors disapproved of this plan, but the president of Sega, so you know, the head honcho in Japan, opted to approve it, and he put his full trust in Kalinsky. Oh, and uh, that random new game to be bundled with the Genesis? You've probably never heard of it, it's very obscure. It was just this little title called Sonic the Hedgehog. Now, when you buy the Sega Genesis that comes with Sonic 1, you'll get Sonic 2 absolutely free. Sonic 2 handles stubborn stains, embarrassing bald spots, no problem. It even slices and dices, makes thousands of julienne fries. But wait, you can play it too. This free Sonic 2 is a $54.99 value. You get two Sonics for the price of one. Sonic 2 fits easily into any tackle box. Made from a space-age polymer plastic for years of family fun. And pets love it too. Buy the Sega Genesis that comes with Sonic 1 and get Sonic 2 free. Act now. Wiener Dog Sweater sold separately. Development for Sonic the Hedgehog began in 1990, when Sega told developers to create a game featuring a mascot for the company. Nintendo had Mario, so it made sense Sega would have some kind of competitor. And at the time, while they did have a number of interesting games, there was a lot of variety and no real standout titles. There was no game you'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's the uh, that's the Sega Genesis game. And so on June 23rd, 1991, Sonic the Hedgehog was released, and the game was packaged with American Genesis consoles. Genesis owners who had bought their console before Sonic had come out actually were able to request free copies of the game by mail, which I have to say was a very cool and consumer-friendly move. I don't think there's any game better than Sonic the Hedgehog to represent the 90s. It was made to be colorful, fast, cool. It needed to stand out, to pop, to really push what the Genesis was going for, and I think that was more than accomplished. The audio, the visuals, the gameplay, it was all just amazing, and the fast-paced action was unlike anything that had ever been seen before. It was the perfect 16-bit title, showing off just how beautiful the graphics could be, with even the first level right from the get-go, blessing your eyes with a plethora of colors and detail in both the foreground and the background. The simple gameplay was also perfect. Sonic was a game anyone could pick up and play, but at the same time, it took some real effort to actually beat, giving it a lot of replay potential. And this is where things would start to get interesting. Sega with Sonic coming out really established themselves as the 16-bit console maker, and this was right before the launch of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System system, or SNES for short. Nintendo, after two years, had finally caught up, and the first and perhaps most famous console wars of all time were just beginning. The SNES actually originally released in late 1990, before Sonic even came out, but this was only in Japan. It would launch in North America the August of 1991, a couple months after Sonic was bundled with the Genesis, and then the rest of the world would get the Super Nintendo in 1992 and onwards. You'd think the SNES, or actually the Super Famicom, as it was 
called in Japan, might have picked up enough interest to outdo the Genesis. After all, Nintendo was much better known. But the problem? Well, the Super Famicom came out in 1990 for Japan, right? Well, Sega never really had much hold of the Japanese market anyways, and so their efforts had strongly increased specifically in North America and Europe. This was in contrast to Nintendo continuing their Japan-first mindset. And so sure enough, when the SNES did launch in North America, the Genesis was already picking up major steam, and that continued to be the case, in large part because of the absurdly popular Sonic the Hedgehog. The Genesis outsold the SNES in the US nearly 2-1 to one during the 1991 Christmas season, and by 1992, Sega would control 65% of the 16-bit console market, marking the first time Nintendo hadn't been the console leader since 1981. And the Genesis would go on to outsell the SNES for four consecutive holiday seasons, thanks to the overwhelming positives surrounding the system, such as the bigger game library, lower price point, which was pretty essential, and of course, Sonic the Hedgehog. It was reported in early 1993 that the Genesis had 250 games versus 75 for the SNES, and some of those games had some serious contention behind them. After the release of the Genesis, video game publisher Accolade began looking into releasing some of their PC games on the new system, but were unwilling to adhere to Sega's licensing costs required for third-party developers. So, and this is absolutely insane, they would reverse engineer the Genesis. They bought a Genesis, decompiled the executable code of three Genesis games, and programmed their own cartridges to disable the security lockouts preventing unlicensed games from being playable. And they would release a game like this with Ishido, The Way of the Stones, coming to Genesis in 1990. So you had a basically black market game being sold in genuine stores, as a genuine Sega game. In order to combat piracy as well as these unlicensed games, Sega would incorporate a code known as the Trademark Security System to a new variation of the Genesis that would add extra protection and more importantly, force the Sega trademark to display when the game was turned on, specifically stating the game was licensed by Sega. This was done by adding a subtle string containing the name Sega at a specific point within the memory of the cartridge. If the string wasn't present, the game simply would not run. Accolade would learn of this at the CES of 1991, when Sega straight up showed the new Genesis rejecting an Ishido game cartridge. Accolade then would back off, reconsider their life choices, and after some deep reflection, start paying Sega the licensing fees, and everyone would live happily ever after. Yeah, okay, not so much. Instead, Accolade successfully managed to add the trademark to their own games, despite being completely unlicensed. Sega, I imagine at this point, laughed maniacally and shouted, you just activated my trap card before suing Accolade in the United States on charges of trademark and copyright infringement, as well as unfair competition. Accolade would respond with an Uno reverse card by countersuing Sega for falsifying the source of its games by displaying the trademark at the powering on of a game. As you likely would expect, the district court would rule for Sega. But upon appeal, this verdict was overturned, and it was somehow determined that the Accolade's decompilation of Sega's software constituted fair use. It was said the use of the software was non-exploitative, albeit commercial. Furthermore, they found that the trademark infringement was Sega's own fault due to the message being required to be played in the first place. Reading this, I'm not gonna lie, I was in absolute shock that Accolade somehow managed to win this fight. This was a landmark court case in gaming history, and it's one of the reasons why reverse engineering and things like emulation are acceptable today. As long as no proprietary code or copyrighted material is used within the final product, thanks in large part to this case, it falls under fair use. So while looking back, it's difficult to find Accolade in any way in the right here. I mean, imagine if a game developer made a bootleg PS5 game and just started selling it at Walmart without Sony knowing anything about it. The result in the end was beneficial to consumers, as less power to game console makers means things like jailbreaking and emulation can exist without too much fear of legal troubles. Going off track a little bit here, my former high school teacher had a big Sega collection and he actually lent me a Sega Dreamcast, which I show just a little bit uh, later in the video, and I plan on doing a full video on it at some point. But he also had a good few Sega Genesis games, and he gave me this one to look at from Accolade. It's called Warp Speed, and you can see on the box it says, for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive systems. So this would have been one of the games that came out before Sega started licensing Accolade games. And looking at the cartridge itself and on the top, on the sticker, it says this video game cartridge was produced by Accolade Inc., notwithstanding any statement to the contrary, which may appear on the brief initial display on your screen. Accolade Inc. is neither affiliated with nor a licensee of Sega Enterprises or any of its affiliates. Copyright 1993 Accolade Inc. All rights
rights reserved. That's right, they put a disclaimer on the top saying that even though, you know, the game said it was, uh, they weren't actually affiliated with Sega. That's absolutely hilarious. And again, as important as that case was, it's still amazing to me that uh, Accolade managed to get away with all of this. The case ultimately was settled in 1993, and Accolade would become an official licensee of Sega while still being able to make their own cartridges, which is why games like Bubsy have unique cartridges for the system. Electronic Arts, yes, that Electronic Arts also did something similar, although a little bit less drama ensued. Nintendo during this time had a firm grip on the approval process for third-party games and would charge a lot of money for cartridge manufacturing. EA wanted a better deal, but going to Sega, they were met with resistance. EA would then crack their knuckles, buckle down, and fully reverse engineer how Sega's system worked, not unlike Accolade, and immediately began developing games for the system. The day before CES in 1990, the founder of EA confronted Sega and informed them that EA was basically just going to release their games regardless of what they said if Sega would refuse to relent to their demands. Sega didn't really seem to have much of a choice, so they agreed, and literally the next day, EA's upcoming Genesis titles were showcased. This is why EA cartridges are designed differently and have a yellow tab on the side. They were directly made by EA, not Sega. While this was probably not a great start to a business relationship, EA games on the Genesis would end up being a massive system seller. Along with this, there were a big number of game devs jumping on board the Sega train to avoid Nintendo's rigorous and expensive licensing process. In spite of initially underestimating Sega, Nintendo would have to loosen restrictions in order not to lose too many developers, which is a good example of why competition is an important thing in any industry. Think of especially smaller game developers who wouldn't normally have been able to get their title out there if Nintendo had continued being the only big console maker and had all the power in the world to charge you as much as they wanted to use their platform. Sega was benefiting greatly from being the first major competitor to pop up. Combine this with the outrageous, aggressive marketing, and the console wars were heating up fast. And the story just gets even crazier from here, with lies and deception becoming commonplace, and we find that the image of the systems were much more important than the hardware itself. The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's blast processing do? What if you don't have blast processing? Sega's advertising would always emphasize the Genesis as the cool, hip, more mature console over the SNES, with phrases like blast processing suggesting that the Genesis power far outdid the stupid, lowly Mario machine. I mean, clearly the Super Nintendo was for kids, right? A Sony focus group actually found out that teenage boys would not admit to owning a Super Nintendo over a Genesis. It was that much of a big deal, and Sega's marketing team was absolutely brilliant to take this approach, even if it was admittedly deceitful. The Super Nintendo was without a doubt the superior system in terms of hardware. It outdid the Genesis in nearly every category, with double the RAM, roughly equal CPU power, way more colors, larger sprites, and better audio. Although the audio might be a bit debatable, as the Genesis included a built-in synthesizer that allowed game makers to use built-in instruments, which is why so many Genesis games tend to sound similar and have those same kind of synthy 90s vibes. Whereas Super Nintendo devs needed to make their music from scratch, which would often results in better quality and higher variety, but the style of the Genesis music is actually kind of preferable to me. And I'm not alone there. The synth style music really fits the cool futuristic theme of the system and kind of gaming in the 90s as a whole. And the nostalgia factor is through the roof going back to nearly any game on the system. Just listen to NHL 94's main theme. It's so good. So in marketing, Sega would essentially lie by omission, claim that they had the amazing blast processing, a mostly meaningless term, implying heavily that they were the best system on the market. And in all fairness, it's not exactly uncommon for companies to say something like they're the number one product on the market without anything substantial to back it up. Plus, the SNES took two more years than the Genesis to come out, and so it makes sense the hardware would be able to be more powerful. And Sega wasn't the only one to be deceptive. Nintendo would claim that it had sold more consoles in 1991 than they actually had, and would forecast sale numbers of 6 million units by the end of 1992, while in reality they would go on to achieve more like 
like 4 million units. And because of these tactics during the early 90s, it was actually really difficult to know which console was the leader in market share. The consoles would trade off different years to win in sales, with Sega typically beating out Nintendo early on, but then Donkey Kong Country helping the SNES outsell the Genesis from 1995 to 1997. Even today, things can be a bit questionable, with the 2004 study of NPD's sales data saying that the Genesis outsold the SNES, and then a 2014 report saying the SNES actually did outsell the Genesis in the US market by 2 million units. The Super Nintendo and Super Famicom sold a widely accepted number of 49.1 million units from 1990 to 2003, and most places like Wikipedia would have you believe the Mega Drive and Genesis sold a combined 30 million units. However, upon further research, it appears a more accurate number would actually be closer to 40 million, including continued sales in Brazil. That 30 million number seems to reflect how many were sold by the mid-90s, which obviously doesn't account for sales that inevitably continued for a couple more years. We may never truly know who sold more consoles in North America due to so many conflicting reports, but officially the SNES is considered the victor by major news publications, and whichever way things went, the numbers were very close. And worldwide, Nintendo beat Sega by at least 9 million units. Nintendo made up a lot of ground near the end of the generation, and don't forget that looking at the previous console war, if you can even call it that, the original NES sold almost 62 million units versus the Sega Master System selling 10 to 13 million units. Alright, hold the phone. Earlier I said the Master System sold terribly, and now I'm saying it sold 10 to 13 million units, about a fifth of the NES. Well, that doesn't seem that bad, and it isn't. The problem is, in North America, it only sold around 1.5 to 2 million units, and thus failed to capture mainstream appeal, because as we all know, for better or for worse, the world tends to follow the USA in pretty much everything. But over in Brazil and Europe, the console did see a lot of success, specifically in Brazil. In fact, believe it or not, the company that was making the Master System in Brazil, Tectoy, is still making them today. Now, if you take the lifetime sales past the original system's production, so including like emulating versions, up to 2016, Brazil has sold about 8 million units alone. And Europe had about almost 7 million units in its entire lifetime. So the console did see some success, and I wanted to kind of make that clear. It's just it wasn't in North America and it wasn't in Japan, which are the two markets that video game makers back in the day saw as truly important. And when it came to those big markets, Sega was the first company to actually challenge Nintendo, and they really gave them a run for their money for a while. Sega had less interest in making the best games as opposed to focusing on being flashy and stylish, whereas Nintendo kind of just kept making good games, and eventually that would pay off. And the 90s really were an interesting time for video games, as they slowly became more mainstream and garnered interest from more and more people. The overall age group started to trend older, likely thanks in part to how Sega marketed their system. This would be a trend that would continue with Sony's PlayStation coming out in 1994, and uh, yeah, that's right, 1994. Coincidentally, right around the time, Nintendo started to outsell the Genesis. Could it be Sega customers were moving to Sony? Well, yes, but they also moved over from Nintendo, and there's a lot of reasons for the downfall of Sega, as they kind of started to implode. But we'll get to that. First, let's take some time here and talk about how the culture surrounding gaming was quickly changing, and how not everyone was happy about it. Young Bobby Angles has a problem. He needs to earn the respect of his peers. So he gets Sega Genesis, the ultimate action system. And then he buys Mortal Kombat, the arcade edition, and the all-new Shinobi 3, and Marvel's X-Men. Now, things are pretty much okay. I said chocolate chip. Say it. Say it. Thank you, thank you! They like the gore, they like the bloody games where people's heads explode, and I think it's attractive to them. The really popular video games are linear, repetitive, uh, really violent. Uh, there's not a lot going on mentally. It's the same repeated movement. The parents who buy some of those games may not realize just how much violence they're getting. One of the most vicious games is called Mortal Kombat. The objective is to finish off your opponent violently. Another method is decapitation. Critics, including the National PTA, say such video games contribute to violence in real life. Congress will be asked to establish a rating system to protect children from gruesome games. We now require warning labels on toys that can potentially damage children's bodies. He says many kids play the games obsessively, 
and he believes the interactive violence affects them long after they shut off the screen. Kids who play a lot are frustrated, they're anxious. Instead of enriching a child's mind, these games teach a child to enjoy inflicting torture. If hypothetically television technology had never been developed, there would be 10,000 fewer homicides each year in the United States, 70,000 fewer rapes, and 700,000 fewer injury assaults. It's essential we don't forget the time period this is all happening in. A cultural revolution of sorts was uprising within the younger generation, in a time where Dungeons and Dragons to many represented witchcraft, and the government's anti-drug PSAs were in full swing in any form of media available. Not to say those two things are on the same level, but the point is that there had already been a quickly increasing concern among parents and adults towards children, and the influences surrounding them. Gone were the days of popping your kid in front of the TV for hours on end, knowing the most violent thing they'd see was likely little house on the prairie. Instead, there was the risk of switching to the wrong channel and getting the recalcitrant and defiant Bart Simpson telling his school teacher to eat his shorts. All this to say, it's understandable people would be worried when suddenly a video game came out that depicted you decapitating the other player and pulling out their head with the spinal cord still attached. Obviously, 30 years down the road, this feels pretty darn tame, and any and every proper study on video game violence shows no real correlation to violence in real life. Mortal Kombat, originally an arcade game ported over to home systems was purposely made to be over the top, and the shocking imagery was very much intentional. But there wasn't a proper rating system in place at the time, and I think we can all agree, taking it in like today's terms, a 13-year-old probably shouldn't be able to walk into their local GameStop and buy the newest Grand Theft Auto without anyone batting an eye. Not saying a 13-year-old can't play GTA, I'm sure a lot of you did when you were 13, but it's a decision that should probably lie with the parents, and it's thanks to games like Mortal Kombat, as well as Night Trap, that the ESRB system exists exists even to this day. It's an imperfect system to be sure, but the due diligence should be done by the parents if they're concerned. And thanks to the internet, you have many resources detailing the violence and sexual content in all forms of media, so you can do your research and it's not a problem. In the 90s though, there really wasn't a way to know what a game would show unless either you were playing it or you saw a fear-mongering television report on the subject. Sega, of course, was at the forefront of all this. They were criticized for marketing violent games towards children, as well as actually allowing blood in Mortal Kombat, whereas on the Super Nintendo, the color was swapped to give it the appearance of sweat. Fatalities had also been toned down. Nintendo was very adamant about keeping things family friendly, but Sega had no such standard, and as a result, if you wanted to play the classic arcade game at home, most would turn to the Genesis as to not lose out on the gore that popularized the game in the first place. This was yet another example of the more mature image of Sega being set. This wasn't simply a console for kids, and if you wanted to impress your classmates properly, you'd better beg your parents to get you the right system, and also hope they hadn't been watching the news while all this controversy was going down. To be completely fair to Sega though, they did end up instituting America's first video game rating system with the Video Game Rating Council, or VRC. You had GA, or General Audiences, MA13 for 13+, which was given to Mortal Kombat, and uh, yeah, you might be thinking, wait what, this apparently gratuitously violent game was given only a 13 plus rating? I mean, you can pull out a guy's spinal cord. Well, I had mentioned on the Nintendo side the violence was toned down, and it actually was on the Genesis as well. In fact, it was even tamer than the SNES version, getting them their highly sought after MA13 rating. However, Sega had figured out how to eat their cake and have it too, by hiding the gore and blood behind a cheat code. Pretty quickly, as the game released, word spread, and you could simply enter what was dubbed the blood code and, you know, access all of it. So at the end of it all, the Genesis version of the game outsold the SNES version three to four times over. Nintendo was even criticized by some for censoring the game, and my personal opinion on it all is that, while well, yeah, Sega was being a bit sneaky, I think them locking the gore behind a cheat code was a really good compromise to give the players the best of both worlds. All this was the subject of focus at a congressional hearing, during which Nintendo was quick to point out that while Mortal Kombat on Genesis did indeed have an age rating, the possibly even more polarizing Night Trap did not. And Night Trap, I can't not talk about Night Trap when it comes to the Sega Genesis and 90s video game culture as a whole. Mortal Kombat was only one half of the violent video game controversy. Another big focus at the meeting of Congress talked 
about the interactive movie video game released for the Sega CD in 1992. Sega CD is something we still haven't talked about, so we'll put a pin on that for now and discuss it a little bit later. All you really need to know is that Night Trap used full motion video to present the story and gameplay, and the user needs to flip through surveillance cameras and trigger traps to snatch anyone putting a house guest in danger. It also just so happens the house was full of teenage girls having a sleepover, and you need to listen to conversations and keep watch to follow along and keep everyone safe. The plot is admittedly pretty silly and shallow, so I won't get very deep into it because it's not too deep to begin with. But the concept here was pretty cool, and at the time it was seen by many as the future of video games. I mean, you can't get better graphics than real life, right? However, the idea of men fully dressed in black kidnapping girls was uh, seen as problematic and shocking to many parents and US senators, and it was claimed by mostly people who had never played the game, self-admitted by some, that it featured excessive violence and promoted sexual aggression towards women. Violence. I mean, come on. Had these people actually played the game, they would know nothing ever happens on camera. The latter point might have held a bit more substance, as there was a nightgown scene in particular that was very controversial, but ultimately there still were no actual depictions of violence, and never any nudity throughout the title. Nintendo would take this opportunity at Congress, as the President, Howard Lincoln, stated Night Trap will never ever appear on a Nintendo system. They really wanted to put themselves forward as the good guys to Congress. And, uh, Ironically, in the August of 2018, an anniversary edition of Night Trap was released for the Nintendo Switch. I'm guessing Howard didn't make that decision. All this was enough to spark a serious conversation, and it led to the Entertainment Software Rating Board being created, or ESRB for short. It's the North American game rating system still used today, so any game with an E or an E10+, plus or a T or an M or whatever, yep, it's ESRB rated, so you can thank Mortal Kombat and Night Trap for that. While it might be hard to take the controversy for these seem tame games too seriously, it's important to remember historical context, as these games really did push the envelope from the moving colored rectangles that came before them. And I think we can all agree that the ESRB, for all its flaws, is a positive thing to have. So hey, it might have been kind of a mess, but the outcome was pretty positive. Looking at the more technical aspect of things, while Night Trap was seen as an innovative game in 1992, obviously full motion video never ended up becoming commonplace, due to the limitations that come with having to film every single outcome, and you know, lack of freedom from the player. You can only do what the game wants you to do. But regardless, Night Trap marked the beginning of the digital era for Sega as the Sega CD came out, or Mega CD outside of North America. Hey! You still don't have a Sega CD? Huh? What are you waiting for, Nintendo to make one? <laughs> you have seen the games, right? Uh, Wrong uh, answer, man. Show them! <laughs> Want to see more? <laughs> Sega had quickly become absurdly successful with the Genesis and the Mega Drive, and they knew they had to take advantage and build on their already huge consumer base. In modern times, makers like Sony and Microsoft often will take a loss when they sell their console, knowing they'll make up their money tenfold from digital purchases. But that wasn't an option in the 90s. Once a console was sold, that was it. Sega wasn't getting any more money from you, beyond royalties from buying games. The other issue here is that there's only so much you can do with 16-bit hardware. Sega was doing really well, but they knew they couldn't get complacent with Nintendo hot on their heels. These here are the Sega CD and 32X, a couple add-ons Sega would make over the Genesis lifetime, and I'm lucky enough to have gotten my hands on them for this video. They are quite expensive due to their rarity, and I wasn't going to go out and buy them specifically for this one video, so another huge thanks to the House of Cards in Abbotsford, BC, Canada, for generously loaning them out to me. They were Sega's attempts to move video gaming tech forward while taking advantage of the huge Genesis user base. In theory, it's easier to get people to buy an add-on than a whole new console, right? And we'll get to just how successful or unsuccessful that was, but I do want to quickly talk about the overall graphical fidelity of the base 16-bit hardware. The Sega Genesis, when it first came out, was one of, if not the most powerful consoles ever created by the late 80s, or at least when it comes to a consumer machine you'd find under somebody's TV in their home. Early 90s, the Super Nintendo had it beat, but Sega had already managed to cement itself as the 16-bit system. More bits means better graphics, and as showed a bit earlier with 
with a brief switch over to the 8-bit Altered Beast versus the 16-bit version, there's a crazy difference in just how much better doubling the pixels enhances the 2D gaming experience. While a lot of games would still look a bit rough around the edges, skipping 30 years down the road, I think it's fair to say that many of the most popular 16-bit era games actually still hold up quite well graphically, especially thanks to the rise in new 2D pixel art games within the last decade, such as Stardew Valley, Celeste, and Shovel Knight. And of course, we can't forget the very popular Terraria, and these are just a few examples. There's a certain charm to these older pixelated sprites, and some of the artwork that was created is absolutely breathtaking, even in a modern context. So while Sega would have the idea that things needed to keep moving onwards, I think in hindsight they had a really good level of power and capability as they were, and there's only so far you can go before graphics just have to move on to 3D. But don't forget, the first fully 3D animated movie with Toy Story wouldn't come out until 1995, so it's very likely that a lot of companies, including Sega, didn't really know what the future was. 3D games were a very abstract concept, and one that hadn't been explored very far yet. That all being said, I think what was more limiting than the amount of pixels was the amount of colors, as the Genesis could only display 64 at a time, whereas the Super Nintendo can display 256. Not to mention, the Genesis has a limited palette in comparison, giving the Super Nintendo just a much wider variety of how scenes could look. It was just better hardware-wise. It was, you know, the Genesis had a couple advantages here and there, but the Super Nintendo really had it beat. And as we've talked about, that's not a huge surprise considering that it came out later. But Sega really didn't want this, and although their marketing was really good, they wanted to keep pushing the envelope, and we see that pretty quickly with the Sega CD and 32X. So let's try to keep in mind that exact mindset that Sega was holding at the start of the craziest decade ever in video gaming history. So it's the 90s, there's only 10 years to the next millennium, and Sega is hard at work making the Genesis and Mega Drive a success. Sega of America would focus on marketing and Sonic the Hedgehog, while Japan would get to work on the upcoming Sega CD. Compact discs had been a rising technology and appeared to be the future, and ideally it would give much bigger storage sizes, which would mean a plethora of benefits to games. The price was initially planned to be 150 US dollars, not cheap, but if it was truly able to transform the Genesis into to a significantly better machine, it would definitely be worth it. But the price only went up throughout development, as the Genesis by itself wouldn't have the power to handle the Sega CD's graphic capabilities, meaning a dedicated CPU had to be incorporated. Based off rumors that a competitor in the Turbo Graphics CD was upgrading the amount of RAM they had, Sega went from 1 megabit of RAM to 6 megabits, bringing the estimated cost to $370. But market research convinced Sega execs that it would sell, so the Mega CD, as it was called would release in Japan in late 1991 and then the Sega CD in North America in 1992. While all this was happening, a division was beginning to grow between Sega of America and Sega of Japan. Japan refused to send Sega of America a working Sega CD until the last minute, only dummy units, and so Sega of America put together their own Sega CD by using a dummy unit and acquiring a ROM and actually installing it themselves. And then another problem arose. The Sega CD was designed with a cheap consumer grade audio CD drive in mind, not a CD-ROM. Quality assurance teams worked desperately to fix things, with it even quite literally bursting into flames late in the run-up to the launch. But hey, it did end up coming out, and uh, didn't sell very well. Who would have known charging $300 US as well as only having two games available at launch were a bad combination for what was an add-on for a console you had already paid good money for? Let's be fair here, the Sega CD was no small feat in terms of technological advancement. The TurboGrafx-16 CD attachment had admittedly beat Sega to the market, but the Sega CD was the first major CD-based console system in terms of attracting the mainstream, and it attached the underside of the original Genesis system. Sega was right in that CD would be the future, with the extremely popular PlayStation being a good example, but unfortunately their implementation and execution here fell short. The system was really strange looking and utilized a front-loading motorized disc tray, and eventually, in mid-1993, the second model of the Sega CD hit store shelves, which is the one I have here. This one fits underneath and to the right of the smaller second model Genesis, and has a top-loading disc tray where you can simply hit the eject button to pop the top up and then put in the disc. There isn't really any satisfying click when you put the disc in like you might expect, so it just kind of sits there which was a little bit odd, but it works and less moving parts means less breakable parts, making this model Sega CD likely more durable in the long run. Plus, the second model here, in my opinion, is a lot better looking than the first one, as it feels like a part of the console, not its own thing. The Sega CD 
CD was a hit at launch, with Sega claiming 200,000 units were sold across the US within 48 hours. But before long, that hype would fade, and Sega wasn't helping things by focusing on full motion video games such as Night Trap instead of taking proper advantage of the huge amount of extra storage space provided by the CD media. The system could still only produce 64 colors, and this would leave grainy, mediocre video displaying from the games attempting to utilize the feature. What really didn't help is that while there were some games designed for the Sega CD from the ground up, the majority of titles were just rehashes of existing Genesis games with minor new content like a CD audio soundtrack and small video sequences with few actual enhancements to the game beyond maybe a couple extra levels. And don't forget, Sega was charging $300 for this thing. I also found that the loading times can be unbearably slow, especially when I was attempting to play Wing Commander, with a lot of times where I just couldn't tell if things were frozen or loading. And perhaps the the disc has some issues where it skips or something, but it was really awkward. Uh, the characters do have actual dialogue and voice lines, which is kind of cool considering how rare that was in early 90s gaming, so it is nice to see the power of compact disc utilized here with my Commodore 64 video monitor. Yeah, that's my uncle's, and yeah, it does look really cool. Not the best display to uh, use Genesis on, as it only has mono audio, especially not great for the Sega CD, but it does look really cool, so uh, I'm okay with it. Sonic CD was the main standout title for the Sega CD, and I do talk about that game a little bit later on, but overall there weren't very many great games, which makes a lot of sense when you look at the sales numbers. Over its lifetime of five years, the Sega CD sold a bit over two million units, which actually in my opinion is kind of a decent success, but maybe not such a great number considering the 30 million Genesis consoles that were sold. You would think at this point Sega would shift focus fully to their next console, but that wasn't the case. Introducing the 32X, yet another add-on for the Genesis. The Atari Jaguar had come out in 1993, and Sega was concerned the 64-bit processing ability would pull away consumers. The 32-bit Sega Saturn, their next console project, likely wouldn't be able to hit markets for another couple years, and Sega of America wasn't really aware of just how much stock Japan was putting into it. And so that Saturn would end up releasing at the same time as the 32X in late 1994, at least in Japan. So yeah, what developer was going to make a game for the 32X on a system as old as the Genesis, and they could focus on the new Sega console instead. The 32X, as the name implies, allowed you to play 32-bit games. It was cheaper than the 32-bit Sega Saturn, but it left Sega's consumer base completely alienated and confused on what was happening or what they should buy. You have a 32-bit add-on coming out for an old console, at the same time a 32-bit new console is coming out. I don't think you can get too much more confusing than that. The 32X was too expensive to be a really proper budget next-gen system alternative, and it was difficult to program for, which meant not a ton of games. And it also wasn't even compatible with the Saturn, meaning you had separate games for both the Saturn and the 32X. Regardless of these issues, the 32X actually had a reasonably successful launch in North America, and eventually Europe, but those sales quickly dropped off as Sega was unable to convince third-party developers to make games for the system, as the future was seen to be in the Saturn, the Nintendo 64, and the PlayStation, as they were all right around the corner. The 32X managed to sell about 800,000 units and was discontinued two years after launch in 1996. The game library was fairly mediocre and limited for the most part, but there were some solid titles such as Doom, although the port to Genesis is typically considered the inferior version. I have never played much of Doom, but the main standout for me is how the game doesn't play in full screen, and looking into it briefly, uh, it's pretty clear this game is missing a lot of content, partly to make it in time for the launch of the 32X, as well as just the fundamental limitations of the Genesis hardware. But hey, it is still Doom on a Genesis, and uh, that's pretty cool. Virtua Racing Deluxe is an enhanced port of the game for Genesis with better visuals and music. The fact that this game runs at all on the Genesis is pretty amazing without the 32X, but apparently it needed a chip within the cartridge to allow it due to the high amount of polygons. But yeah, this is a full 3D game running on the Genesis with the 32X. This version is quite a bit better than the original for the Genesis, and it's much closer to the actual arcade experience. Really cool to play a 3D game on the Genesis. Like, seriously, this console came out technically 
in the 80s. It didn't even come out in the 90s. That's amazing. The hardware of the 32X is a bit funny looking, but a lot more compact than the Sega CD, going into the cartridge slot on the top of the console, with a cord connecting it to the Genesis on the back for passing through video. And it also annoyingly requires power from a completely separate power brick. The Sega CD also does this. So for the six games that require both the 32X and the Sega CD, you would need to have a total of three giant power adapters plugged in, which is just ridiculous, not to mention the cord for your TV and probably the other dozen things you need to plug in around your TV area. Sega of America was really high on the 32X, pouring millions into marketing and hyping it up to be the future of gaming now. Why wait when you can play the best of the best right then and there? But with the Sega Saturn launching at the same time in Japan, something that Japan failed to initially tell America about, it was really hard to convince buyers. It didn't help that over on the SNES side, Donkey Kong Country came out, which not only looked fantastic, but also was just a really fun game and would go on to be the third best-selling Super Nintendo game ever released. And it could be played on the base hardware without any accessory needed to be bought. Sega and other competitors were so focused on pushing the limits of graphical power, they kind of forgot the most important aspect in video games, the games. And I think that's the biggest reason Nintendo would eventually win out. The simple truth in all this is that Sega stretched themselves too thin. They should have focused on making the Saturn better, especially in North America, as it turned out to be a huge disaster for a wide variety of reasons. Sega was quickly plummeting into disarray, and the writing was on the wall. But there was still so much potential. They had a killer franchise in Sonic the Hedgehog, and there were some truly masterful games released for the Genesis. There was a reason the console sold so darn well, and it wasn't just for the more mature branding and excessive marketing. The Genesis was fun, and that's all that really mattered. <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say. Welcome to the next level. The game library of the Sega Genesis was always its main draw, in spite of the relentless advertising campaign and confusing add-ons. Initially, the variety of games was very modest, having ports of arcade titles like Altered Beast, which was of course bundled with the system. Down the line though, some seriously huge games would release, with the top sellers including the likes of Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Disney's Aladdin, Mortal Kombat, and many, many sports titles. Electronic Arts was one of the earliest third-party companies to support the Genesis, and the president of EA at the time believed the system was superior to the SNES for sports titles due to the faster drawing speed. So while the SNES was the more powerful system, there were still benefits to the Genesis hardware, and EA was one of the developers to take advantage. What's kind of interesting is that there was a very high amount of game sales for individual Sega Genesis owners, especially compared to the Super Nintendo. In 1997, Sega of America claimed there was a rate of 16 games sold per console, which doubled that of the SNES. Sega made bank off the Genesis, which in theory should have set them up very positively for the future, making it all the more tragic they were never able to recapture its success. Mortal Kombat is always the fighting title that comes to mind when thinking of the 90s, but Street Fighter 2 from Capcom was another hit that actually skipped the Genesis release altogether, coming to the SNES only. But as the Genesis continued to grow rapidly in popularity, Capcom would give in and port a version of the game titled as Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition, which would end up selling around 1.5 6 million copies. Disney's Aladdin is a title always worth talking about because it was a very big draw for the Genesis over the SNES, almost surprisingly so. Disney, for whatever reason, had different developers from different companies work on Aladdin for the different systems. The SNES game would be made by Capcom, and Virgin Games handled the Genesis system. And yeah, Virgin Games, they were owned by the same group that still owns Virgin Mobile to this day. Kind of strange to see them pop up in video game history, but they published games up until mid-2003 when they were acquired and subsequently rebranded by a French developer. There's actually always been this really heated debate among 90s game enthusiasts over the SNES Aladdin versus the Genesis, and typically it comes down to which console you were more loyal to, for which version you prefer. However, attempting to look at it objectively, the general consensus online is that the Genesis version was the superior game. This is especially because of the sword. Keeping with Nintendo's family-friendly mindset, the SNES didn't get to have the iconic Arabian scimitar. Often the heaviest 
criticism levied against the Genesis Aladdin is that it was just too difficult. And I can attest to that, as I never got even close to beating it as a kid. My mom loved this game when she was younger, and I believe she could get to the end of the game, but just never had enough apples to beat Jafar. Apples were projectiles you could collect and throw, and uh, yeah, even coming back to this game today, I don't have the patience to sit down and beat it. It's certainly no cakewalk. The graphics here were a technical marvel for 1993, and among the best ever produced in the 16-bit era, with flowing, gorgeous animations, and a beautiful art style that really just makes the whole experience feel about as close to the movie as you can get with the technical limitations of the time. And the music, all oh, the music. That Genesis synthesizer recreating the music from the movie provided such a fantastic blessing to the ears. So, other popular games that sold over a million copies. You've got NBA Jam, Jurassic Park, Miss Pac-Man, NFL 98, NFL Football 94, Sonic Spinball, X-Men, and probably at least a couple more titles. It might not sound like a lot, but in the early days of video games, it wasn't so common to own a ton of games. They were darn expensive. If you were going to spend money on what most parents considered to be a toy more than anything else, you had to be pretty selective. Plus, don't forget nowadays, the average person buying games is quite a bit older, with lots of people in their 20s and 30s. You know, they actually have money to spend and don't need to beg their parents. Well, in most cases anyways. It's really too bad that games were so expensive back in the day, and most of them, you couldn't even save your progress. If only there was a way to, you know, access games kind of like uh, Netflix almost, where you could just stream games. Uh, well, there, there was, yeah, in uh, the 1990s. I'm not kidding. Launched in the December of 1994, there was the Sega Channel, which was provided to the public by TCI and Time Warner Cable through cable television by the way of a coaxial cable. It was a pay-to-play service, meaning you could subscribe and then access Genesis video games online. You could play game demos, you could get cheat codes, and this service would last from 94 all the way until 1998. Using cable television was such a brilliant way of managing to reach so many households. I mean, most people had cable, or at least, you know, the people who'd be buying a Sega Genesis in the first place. It made a lot of sense. So if you were willing to pay $15 American every month, plus a $25 activation fee, which included the cartridge, the cartridge being more of an adapter that would plug into your TV, you could access up to 50 games for the Genesis at any one time. The titles would rotate monthly, and some updates would even happen on a weekly basis. In 1997, Sega would up the games to 70 and the update frequency to bi-weekly. Some of these games are really big, such as like Sonic and Knuckles, Aladdin, Super Street Fighter 2. It's insane to think that basically the precursor to Xbox's Game Pass happened all the way back in the 90s. The service would go on to garner as many as 250,000 subscribers, which was pretty good, but Sega did expect more, and so unfortunately it wasn't the money maker they were hoping it would be. But this section is supposed to be talking more about the games, so let's get back to that. We've gone over the big name games, that sold over a million units. But just because a game didn't sell amazingly doesn't mean that it isn't awesome. So let's run through a few more games. Echo the Dolphin is a legendary title as it has such a friendly appearance, but in reality is one of the toughest games on the platform. Seriously, don't play it. Earthworm Jim was an iconic platformer in the 16-bit era. You've got Castlevania Bloodlines, Shining Force 2, Gunstar Heroes, Streets of Rage 2, a westernized version of Poyo Poyo called Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, Fantasy Star 4, Vector Man, which has to be one of the most technically impressive games on Genesis ever, Monster World 4, Toe Jam and Earl, and so many more that I couldn't possibly mention them all. I will briefly go over Sonic the Hedgehog 3 though, as it was pretty darn unique for a specific reason. Gameplay wise, it was about what you would expect, and it was considered an improvement over previous installments, and it was fairly successful with over a million copies sold. But what makes it so unique is that it was initially developed as a singular game combined with another game, Sonic and Knuckles, which also came out in 1994 and features gameplay controlling both Sonic and, you guessed it, Knuckles. Time constraints and small cartridge sizes forced Sega to split the project. So what was done is the Sonic and Knuckles cartridge was given this lock-on technology, where you could insert a second cartridge into the top. I managed to pick up one of these old games, so that was pretty awesome. 25 bucks Canadian, not bad. If you insert Sonic 3, which unfortunately I couldn't find, you're able to play both games as one title, Sonic 3 and Knuckles. And I would imagine that's the way that was originally intended. You can also put in Sonic 2, where you can play through Sonic 2 as Knuckles, which is pretty neat. And with the original Sonic the Hedgehog, you're also able to access some stuff. So all in all, this is just a really smart implementation to get around the technical limitations of the time and encourage players to own all of the Sonic games to get the full experience. Something interesting and kind of crazy about Sonic 3 is just how good the soundtrack was. I've been using its music throughout this video, and what's strange about it is there is some pretty serious conspiracy
conspiracy stuff surrounding the music, with many claiming that Michael Jackson actually helped work on it. Why do people even think this? Well, apparently parts of the soundtrack sound pretty similar to tunes from Michael Jackson's own music, but Michael Jackson has never been credited, and Sega has always denied his involvement. So if he was involved, why would they deny it? Well, there's a couple possible reasons. The first is that Jackson may not have wanted his name attached to a compressed video game soundtrack, as maybe he thought it would make him look bad. The second theory is, unfortunately, this is right around the time when Michael Jackson was hit with child molestation allegations in 1993, so it would make sense if Sega just didn't want his name attached to anything. Ultimately, uh, all we have is a maybe for whether or not Michael Jackson was a part of it, and Sega has only continued to deny it, so uh, we'll probably never know for sure. We've talked about the Sega CD, but we haven't mentioned its most popular game. As stated before, the Sega CD sold around 2 million units, and its most popular game, with 1.5 million copies sold, was Sonic CD. 1.5 million copies, that's like 3 out of 4 Sega CD owners. Sonic CD was a 1993 Sonic platformer that was known for its time travel feature. Yeah, time travel, mid-stage, and it was a key aspect to both the story and gameplay, as it would alter the stages, music, and graphics with each switch. The game received critical acclaim, and it's still considered one of the greatest Sonic games ever created for the distinctive gameplay and Metal Sonic introduction. Knuckles Chaotix was released for the 32X and was a commercial failure, just like the 32X. The game received mixed reviews, with some considering it to have the best graphics thus far in any Sonic title, while others found it just to be a bit too much. It was likely the best game for the 32X, but I mean, that's not really saying a lot, considering how few games even came out for it. Although enthusiasts of the console might disagree with me there. A lot will point to NBA Jam Tournament Edition or the Star Wars Arcade as being some of the best on the system. And in all fairness, you know, the 32X did have some good games, so just don't take me the wrong way. IGN said they admired the attempt to breathe life into a series that was running out of steam, but felt the physics were clunky and unorthodox. They described it overall as a bad game with a good foundation, failing to live up to its predecessors. It is still considered to be one of the last classic Sonic games before the 3D era began. And when it comes to my personal experience, experience with games, there weren't too many my mom had for the system by the time it reached my grubby little hands. Of course Sonic 2 was my favorite, even though I could never get past the second act of the chemical plant zone, at least in my younger years. There was that stupid rising purple water or acid or whatever. I'm not sure if my mom or her brother ever even had the first Sonic game, it's possible, but if they did, it's long gone now. NHL 94, oh boy, it's considered not only one of the best sport games of all time, but quite possibly one of the best video games of all time, and it has a legacy that keeps it considered as basically the ultimate hockey video game. And of course I'm biased being a huge hockey fan, but I'm not the only one with this opinion. And it was actually remade in 2020 with NHL 94 Rewind, bringing it to modern systems with the modern teams and players. Pretty darn cool and fun to play on my PS5. Quackshot is a game I only faintly remember playing, but it's basically Donald Duck as Indiana Jones and that alone is enough to get me on board. I've talked about Aladdin a bit, I was always bad at it, and the only way to get anywhere in the game was to use cheat codes, of which which my mom had cut from a magazine and stuck in the game case. Actually, she had written down many cheat codes for a ton of different games, which is pretty cool. Any cartridges you see that I don't specifically mention here, by the way, I either purchased for this video, like Mortal Kombat, or I borrowed them from a buddy of mine, like Echo the Dolphin here, so big thanks to him. Toy Story is a game you don't hear much about for Genesis, probably because it came out at the end of the 16-bit era, but it's actually very notable, due to it pulling off 3D rendered graphics on the Genesis, something that had been done on the SNES, but never on the Sega console. Vectorman also managed to pull this off, releasing about a month beforehand, and that game is very impressive graphically. I have no clue how far I ever got in this game, although I do remember playing it quite a bit. The last game I played a ton of on Genesis is one that's pretty well known by gaming enthusiasts, but for all the wrong reasons. Bubsy. Yeah, it came out in 1993, and well, it wasn't very well received. Ironically, this was my mom's favorite game for the Genesis. She played a ton of it and absolutely loved it. I remember thinking it was just super difficult, and it was too easy to die, and uh, looking back, I wasn't wrong on the second part at least. I mean, it is super difficult too, but uh, it's not the fair kind of difficult. This is just a mess of a game. The developers had hoped to come up with a sassy mascot to compete with Mario and Sonic, and instead they ended up making what IGN would call a pale Sonic imitator with floaty, imprecise physics and just strange level design. It's not even a bad looking game, it was quite bright and colorful, but it's so frustrating to play through. You're constantly just gliding down large drops without any way to know where you're landing. You pick up speed really darn easy. And uh, yeah, everything just results in a ton of deaths you can't do anything about. 
<laughs> what just happened? Bubsy 2 would come out a year later, and there was Bubsy 3D for the PS1, which uh, we don't talk about Bubsy 3D. Anyhow, at the end of it all, I have a lot of fond memories on the Sega Genesis, and I'm just one man born 10 years after the Genesis released, so suffice to say, those who properly grew up with it had a really enjoyable time, and the legacy of Sega is one that just can't be ignored looking back at gaming history, and what has brought us to the point we're at today. From 1989 with the North America launch, to 1997 with the eventual discontinuation, the Sega Genesis managed to do what few other consoles have done in becoming a video game icon, the like we've seen very few times since, and managing to set the precedent of properly competing with Nintendo that Sony and their PlayStation would end up running with. But time stops for no man, and the Genesis wasn't going to last forever. Without Sega doing something fast, they would be stuck in the past with nothing but a 16-bit system and a ton of plastic cartridges. We are five years away from entering the 21st century. Humankind stands on the edge of the interactive age. You have come a long way. But are you ready for the future? Introducing Sega Saturn. Aww. Hit it! Sega's next generation gaming platform, revolutionary sports and arcade gameplay, all with amazing new 3D experiences never before possible on home game systems. Wow. The year is 1994, the 32X is on the way, and simultaneously, the Sega Saturn was releasing only a day after in Japan featuring 32 bits and complete incompatibility with the 32X. The Sega Saturn is kind of a fascinating console, even if it was a complete and utter failure, but it was a major catalyst in Sega's fast approaching implosion. At the first ever E3 convention in 1995, Sega of America CEO Tom Kalinske revealed the US price of the Saturn to be $400 with a cost copy of Virtua Fighter bundled in. He then shocked everyone by saying due to high demand, consoles had already been shipped to various retailers for immediate release, which angered retailers who hadn't heard anything about this. A lot of them hadn't heard anything about this, including Best Buy and Walmart. Many of the stores left out of the loop would be very offended and straight up refused to sell the console, which certainly did not bode well for its future. The Europe release also came early, and it all culminated in a console that not a lot of people had heard of without the usual benefit benefit of the press hyping it up, and there just hadn't been time for the advertising to make a splash, although not for lack of trying. The Sega Saturn's US launch apparently included a $50 million advertising campaign that targeted a more mature adult audience than the Sega Genesis ads, and went through some strange mediums, including Playboy magazine for some reason. Despite all this, the Sega Saturn only had six games at launch, with the majority of third-party games having been prepared to launch at the original date in September, but of course, Sega wanted to beat PlayStation. PlayStation to the punch. PlayStation launched in the September of 1995 as they had been planning and sold more units than the Saturn had in five months, basically immediately. What really hurt Sega was the lack of games, at least for one thing. Virtua Fighter was popular in Japan, but not so much for Western audiences. There was no Sonic game, and you know, it was a Sega console. The other big thing besides the random release date was the price of $400. That was really darn expensive for a console. The PlayStation had already been released in Japan, but of course, wouldn't go to North America for a number of months. And so when Sony heard that Sega was moving up their release date, they had to do something. This resulted in perhaps the most famous clip of any E3 convention ever, and really, in my opinion, marks the moment Sega officially died. Join me for a brief presentation. $2.99, a full hundred dollars less than the Sega Saturn. Yeah, I'd say that was a pretty good selling point. At the end of 1995, Sega would reduce the price of the Saturn to $2.99, but it was too late, the damage was done, and the PlayStation's quickly growing game library put Sega's to shame. Within the first year of its life, PlayStation had secured over 20% of the entire US video game market, and at the 1996 E3, Sony reduced its price to only $1.99. Sega, of course, quickly announced it would match that price, even though the 
Saturn hardware was more expensive to manufacture, but it was all in vain, they had already lost. Because of the late launch with the PlayStation, 16-bit consoles and games actually managed to account for 64% of sales in 1995. Sega had really under-evaluated continued interest in the Genesis and didn't have the inventory to meet demand, with Tom Kalinske estimating they could have sold another 300,000 Genesis units during the holiday season had they been prepared, but even so, Sega sold over 2 million units throughout the year, which was a pretty impressive number considering the quickly aging hardware. But between America and Japan, that rift just kept growing, thanks to the ridiculous success of the PlayStation. The atmosphere of Sega apparently got tense fast, with a lot of finger-pointing and disagreements between Sega of Japan and Sega of America, and let's just say tempers were running short. Japan had been fully focusing on the Saturn, which is likely what led to not enough inventory for the Genesis, and Kalinske was not happy about this. He would go on to resign in 1996. He had been strongly against releasing the Saturn early, knowing there were too few games and consoles in stock, and he wasn't a fan of the Saturn in the first place. He would go on later to say that he didn't believe anyone could have marketed the Saturn, but Sega of Japan forced him to try anyway. Under Kalinske's reign as CEO of Sega of America, there was growth from a value of $72 million to over $1.5 billion, and Sega's value as a whole went from under $2 billion to over $5 billion. While I'm not going to say Kalinske was necessarily in the right about everything, I do think he was dealt a difficult hand. Obviously Sega needed to move on from the Genesis at some point, but the Saturn was just a bad console to have to market, especially with Japan forcing him to rush it. He really just didn't have a lot of choice in the matter, and he had previously best performed with the freedom that he was given in the early days. While the Sega Saturn is considered a commercial failure, what's kind of funny is that out of its total of 9.26 million units sold, over half of that came from Japan, and it would even outsell the Nintendo 64 in Japan. The focus on the Japanese market had paid off, but the ignoring of the Western world had only served to hurt Sega in the grand scheme of things. There's probably a lesson to be taken from all this somewhere, maybe about hubris or eating your fruits and vegetables, I don't know. But I think ultimately what we have here is a gaming company that managed to get too big too fast and wasn't able to keep that up and ever recapture that success. Although they would come closer than ever with the eventual Sega Dreamcast. The Sega Saturn had many problems, from the butchered release to the lack of games in the lineup, and the Dreamcast would rectify all that. But unfortunately, with the PlayStation 2 coming out and the Xbox soon after, Sega would discontinue the Dreamcast as their hopes of remaining a console manufacturer disappeared. It's really too bad, because the Dreamcast was a great piece of hardware, and there was so much potential. I'll definitely be doing a video on it at some point. The 1990s could very well be the most interesting era of video games we'll ever see. For the past 20 years or so, you've had the big three consoles, Nintendo, PlayStation, and Xbox, with no new competitors ever making any ground. Compare that to the free-for-all of the 90s, with Sega coming out of nowhere, finally challenging the stranglehold of Nintendo, and then the PlayStation coming along and taking advantage of Sega's complacency. The Genesis is only a piece of the 90s video game puzzle, but it's a pretty darn big piece. And while it's easy to get caught up in the politics and drama and story behind it all, something I've definitely done in the process of making this video, I do think it's essential we remember the Genesis not for the eventual failures of the company, but for what it was at the beginning. A new, rebellious, innovative machine that brought some of the best video games ever to come out, and a change to the gaming industry that has impacted every aspect of the market even to this day. Sega still lives on making games, but it's always going to be remembered for the Genesis. And those lucky enough to have owned a Genesis Genesis will always at least keep the Sega name alive. What Nintendo And on that note, I think I'm about finally done here. This is by and far the longest video I have ever made on this channel, uh, besides live streams, if those count. And it's not something I originally meant to happen. It just kind of happened as I kept adding to the video and finding more and more of the drama surrounding the Sega Genesis and its story. It's such an insane console, so very happy I was able to take this in-depth look at it. It took a long time, so maybe hit that like button and uh, consider subscribing for more content, probably not 
quite as long as this, but you know, similar in nature. Big shout out again to House of Cards in Abbotsford, British Columbia for lending me their Sega CD in 32X. That was a big help. And if you'd like to keep up with me, you can follow me over on Twitter and Instagram at 91 underscore tech. And if you'd like to talk with some like-minded tech users, maybe come by and uh, join the Discord. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, I mean, wow, thank you. It's, it's so cool, you know, the fact that my mom's Sega Genesis, my mom's and her brother's Sega Genesis from like the early 90s is not only still around today, but like 30 years down the road was used for a video like this. It's really cool, but I've, uh, I've got no more to say. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.